This video will address some of the common issues that I find students have when working with Punnett squares. Um, had a part A of this video, which was one trait crosses or monohybrid crosses. So today we're going to look at two trait crosses or dihybrid crosses. So I just have written out here an example involving tomatoes where purple stems are dominant to green stems. And as soon as I see something like that, I'm going to write down some symbols. Big P is equal to purple, which is dominant over little p, which is equal to green. And that is true for the stems of the tomato plants. I haven't really paid attention to the stems of tomato plants, but I guess there may be two types. Now, we also have that big T would be red tomatoes are dominant over little t. Those would be yellow tomatoes. That's the actual tomato itself, not the stem. So I just write out the symbols so I know what I'm talking about for the rest of this example. Now, the first thing that students run into, a bit of bit of trouble they see sometimes on exam questions, is this statement right here. The two genes are located on separate chromosomes. That's a pretty important statement to make because what that statement tells us is that these two genes are inherited independently from one another. In other words, a plant with purple stems doesn't automatically have to have red tomatoes and a plant with green stems doesn't automatically have to have yellow tomatoes. They're on different chromosomes, which means they're inherited completely independently of one another, which is Mendel's law of independent assortment. What that statement tells us, the two genes located on separate chromosomes, is that because Mendel's law of independent assortment applies, we can treat this as a regular Punnett square and we can do all the rules and all the, the symbols that we use in a regular Punnett square. There's no linked traits here that would cause any kind of upset to what we normally expect. So I can go ahead and write out the genotypes of two plants. Uh, let's start with a uh, heterozygous individual, heterozygous for both traits. So if a plant is heterozygous for both traits, that means it would be big T, little t, big T, little t. And already we run into one of the issues I sometimes see students having, and that is writing out the genotype correctly. Sometimes students will write out the genotype where they'll put big P, big T, and then uh, little p, little t, and they'll, they'll group the dominant alleles together and the recessive alleles together. It's always a good habit to keep both of the p's together and both of the t's together, and don't mix them up and get them separated out. All right, so that's the first situation I sometimes see, just writing those letters out in the genotype of the original individual. Now, let's say that we do a genetic cross, or we, we uh, multiply this times an individual, and let's say that we're going to multiply this by an individual that is homozygous recessive. In other words, green stems and yellow tomatoes. So that would be little p, little p, little t, little t. You notice I keep the p's together, I keep the t's together. Now we'll call this our parent generation. These are the parents, and F1 is going to be the offspring. Now, quite often we're in a genetics problem, we have to find out what is the genotype or the phenotype or the genotype ratios or phenotype ratios of the F1 generation. To do that, we would use a Punnett square. Now, to construct a Punnett square, it was relatively easy with a single trait cross because all we did is we separated out the alleles. We separated the big P and the little p and wrote it out and made a small Punnett square. But our Punnett square here is going to be bigger because we've got four alleles, four letters. Well, then there's different ways that these letters can come together to make gametes. Gametes are either sperm or egg that each plant can make. So let's just assume right here that we're going to, from this plant right here, we're going to get uh, the male gametes, the sperm. So it doesn't matter if we're getting sperm or ova, we do it exactly the same way. We have to figure out all the different combinations, all the different ways the P's and T's can come together. And to do that, we're going to borrow a technique from uh, algebra. We're going to borrow the idea of FOIL. FOIL is first. Outside, inside, last. It's an acronym. That's what it stands for. So just a real quick review of some math here. If we're doing FOIL and math, I'm just going to do it over here inside. And we have uh, two binomials and we want to multiply them together. Let's say A plus B and A minus B. Well, in math class, you would have learned that you can apply FOIL. First, outside, inside, last. And what that means is you take the first term times the first term. And if you do that, you would get A squared. Then you do the inside term times the, uh, sorry, let's do the outside, let's spell FOIL correctly here. All right, so we'll start that again. So then we do our outside term. 
which would give us negative AB. Then we would do our inside term, which is positive AB. And then we would multiply our last term, the last B, the last B, and we would get negative B squared. And you'd end up with a difference of squares, A squared minus B squared. Okay, that's, that's from that class. But the whole point of demonstrating that is they're using FOIL. First, outside, inside, last to multiply terms. We can do the same thing when we construct a Punnett square. We can use FOIL to figure out what are the genotypes of all the various gametes that could be produced from a plant. So in this case, we would take the first P and the first T. That's one possible combination we could get for gametes. Some of the sperm, some of the pollen, the, the sperm cells in the pollen would be big P and big T. Then we can take the outside P and the outside T. That would give us a big T and a little T. So that's another combination we could get. We could take the inside P with the inside T. That would be little P with big T. And finally, we could take the last P with the last T. And that would be little P, little T. Now, remember what this is telling us. This is telling us that these right here are all the possible combinations of P's and T's we could get in the gametes of that plant. Because a gamete can only have one P and one T. So the gamete here, we said this was a sperm cell, so it's a male, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we get one P and one T in four different combinations. And foils that helps us sort that out. Now, for the other plant, we can do the same thing. We can do foil again. You'll see here, though, this one's a little bit easier. If we do foil, the first P and the first T will be a little P and a little T. And then the outside P and the outside T will be little p and little t. We could do the inside p and the inside t, which would give us little p, little t. And I think you can see where this is going. Then we can use the last p and the last t, and we get little p and little t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill out this Punnett square. And the purpose of filling out the Punnett square is to figure out the genotypes and phenotypes of the F1 generation. That means the offspring of the P generation. So in filling out this Punnett square, we get big P, little p, big T, little t. We get big P, little p, little t, little t. We get little p, little p, big t, little t. And we get little p, little p, little t, little t. Now that's the first row of the Punnett square. Because all the rest of these rows are exactly the same, we're going to be able to fill it out in exactly the same way. So I'm just going to pause the video here for a moment and fill it out. So there's our Punnett square completed. And we can see, like I said, each row of the Punnett square is the same. Let's keep in mind this is all for our F1 generation, the offspring of the P generation. So I'm just going to scroll down, make a little bit of room here. Now we're going to now address phenotype and genotype ratios. So let's just get rid of our math here for a minute. We don't need that anymore. All right, so let's start with the genotype ratio. A genotype ratio means the relative number of each possible genotype in our Punnett square. And if I look carefully at this Punnett square, I can see that there are four different genotypes. The four different genotypes are, I'm just going to put a blank here because we're going to count them up and we'll put a number there. But we've got big P, little p, big T, little t right there. Now, a couple things you want to watch out for when filling out Punnett squares. Please make sure you put your P's together with your T's together and you put your uh, dominant allele first and recessive allele second. For example, when I've got big P, little p, big T, little t, sometimes I see students trying to fill this out, big P, big T, little p, little t, where you mixed up your P's and your T's. Keep your P's together, keep your T's together. I'll also sometimes see something like this, where we'll get little p, big p, little t, big t. Nope, keep your dominant allele first, 
Put the dominant one first, then the recessive one. Keep your P's together, keep your T's together, keep the wheels of the same letter together. So we're going to have a certain number of big T, little T, big T, little T. Matter of fact, we're going to have four of those. Then, x square over, we're going to have big P, little P, little T, little T. And count those up. And you guessed it, we got four of those. And we're going to have little P, little P, big T, little T. Leave room for a number there. And yep, one, two, three, four. And then finally, little p, little p, little t, little t. And let me fix this one. I may have, may have confused some of you there. I apologize. This was little p, little p, big t, little t, of course. All right, the last one, little p, little p, little t, little t. One, two, three, four. So there are four of those. Now, when we write a genotype ratio, or genotypic ratio, we sometimes call that, uh, common mistake I see students write is they would write this confidently as a 4 to 4 to 4 to 4 ratio. However, ratios are like fractions. We always reduce them to lowest terms. So instead of 4 to 4 to 4 to 4, we should be writing this as reduced down to 1, okay, pen here, 1 to 1 to 1 to 1. All right, so reduce your ratios. Now, that's a genotypic ratio. For a phenotypic ratio, phenotype ratio if you prefer, we need to write out, well, what do these actually look like? So the first one here is going to be purple stems, because big T was dominant. So purple stems and red tomatoes. And we'll have one of those. The next one here is going to be purple stems because of the big P, and because two little T's, we're going to have yellow tomatoes. Purple stems, yellow tomatoes. And we're going to have one of those. Now, I've run out of room over on the side, so I'll write it down here. The next one is two little P's, so that's going to be green stems, and a big T would make it yellow tomato. So green stems, yellow tomato. We have one of those. And then last possibility is we've got two little P's and two little T's right here, so that's going to be green stems and yellow tomatoes. I did that again. For some reason, I keep wanting to do that here. This uh, would be green stems, red tomato. I did that twice. All right. Now, this one here is going to be green stems and yellow tomatoes. Let's get that straight. And we're going to have one of those. So we're going to get a phenotype ratio of one purple red to one purple yellow to one green red to one green yellow. Now, Having done that Punnett square, it's a lot of writing, and Punnett squares, quite honestly, are a bit of a pain to fill out, and they're prone to mistakes, as I made a mistake when I was writing this one, and I had to erase that one and start that one again. Yeah, prone to mistakes. So anytime we can use a shortcut, probably a good idea. So in the next video, part C of this series of videos, uh, I'm going to go through when it's appropriate to use a shortcut, how we can use shortcuts to keep our Punnett square small and manageable to minimize the chance of making mistakes. Then we'll also look at some exam questions where we can use those shortcuts.